Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. We are in the final week of this course and in today's uh, lesson, I will be uh, speaking about a few general issues surrounding uh, women's labor force participation and I have titled today's lecture as Women in India's Labor Market. Now, uh, in this last week, I intend to talk about uh, India's labor market with specific reference to women in India's labor force because uh, by now we do understand that uh, the health market and the education market are deeply connected to the labor market. Now, one of the reasons why uh, we uh, want to understand the interventions in the health market and the interventions in the education market in terms of human capital creation is because ultimately as far as the economy is concerned in terms of uh, production, in terms of uh, distribution of resources or in terms of how uh, human resource becomes human capital, we ultimately uh, want to think in terms of whether or not the population of the country is moving towards uh, the uh, labor force or not. And that is one of the important parameters of progress and economic growth in a country. So, it is but obvious that in the context of discussion of uh, education and health, we also need to understand uh, what is happening in the labor market. The human capital that is getting created within a country because of education and health investments, are they transitioning to the labor market or not? Now, in the last few years, there has been a lot of discussion surrounding unemployment in India. There has been a lot of discussion surrounding changes in labor force participation rates in India. Indian economy has of course gone through a very important phase of uh, uh, economic transformation in terms of very high growth rates of GDP as well as uh, many changes in terms of the sectoral composition of output. Uh, we continue to be a largely agrarian society but the percentage of population that is dependent on agriculture relatively seem to have declined from the period of the 1980s to 1990s and so on. So, in today's uh, lecture, I want to slightly diverge from uh, the discussion on uh, education and health, but understand what are the implications of uh, these investments or human capital investments on the labor market. So, I have uh, designed uh, today's uh, lecture into two parts. In the first part, we will understand uh, the contemporary issues surrounding India's labor market. And here I want to take uh, reference to the unemployment estimates that uh, we have currently with us and some of the issues surrounding the uh, unemployment estimates and the comparability of the unemployment estimates. So, we will sort of try to understand what is the recent debate and how do we approach uh, this debate. What do the overall trends tell us about the employment of the labor force in India today? And what do we conclude about female labor force participation in India from the various studies that we have had uh, recently? Then in the second part of the lecture, I want to give out some estimates with respect to access to education in India, focusing on how many enrollments have taken place in uh, primary education, secondary education, higher education. And then we want to see whether uh, the numbers that are in education are transitioning to the labor market or not in terms of the numbers. And then we want to understand what are the major reasons as to why India's women are dropping out of the labor force. And then finally, we want to talk about some of the uh, estimates on public spending on education, where do we stand in terms of our uh, spending status. And then finally, I will summarize today's uh, lesson with some key points about the complexities uh, surrounding India's women labor force participation. So, uh, let us begin with uh, India's unemployment statistics. Now, there are of course various uh, data sources for employment unemployment, but one of the most important data source over the period of last uh, 40 years or so that we have had was what is called the NSS EUS or the National Sample Survey Organization EUS or Employment Unemployment Survey. Now, this NSS EUS was started by the NSSO in the 1950s and it was only from the 32nd round which is the 1970s that it formally became part of the national quinquennial household surveys of the NSSO. Now, quinquennial household surveys meaning the household surveys which are carried out every 5 years. 
Now, there are of course various other sources of data that also provides us information on economic activity status such as we have had census of India, economic censuses, uh, we have reports of national commission of labor, the annual survey of industries, employment market information program uh, which is provided by the directorate general of employment and training. We also get information from employment exchange statistics and so on. But in terms of official sources of data, the NSS EUS was by far the only comprehensive source of data on employment and unemployment using the same concepts and definitions and methods of data collection for more than four decades. Unfortunately, by the end of 2012, the 68th round, we have not had any more EUS surveys and uh, altogether we have had 9 quinquennial surveys on employment and unemployment conducted by the NSSO. So, uh, one of the first rounds was 1972-73 followed by 77-78. In the 1980s, there were 2 rounds in 83 and 87-88. In the 1990s, there were 2 rounds 93-94 and 99-2000. And in the 2 decades of the 2000s, we have had 2004, 5, 9, 10 and 11, 12. Now, when the uh, NSS EUS was discontinued, we of course have lost some of the scope of comparability with the earlier rounds of the NSSO. But what we have in its place is uh, what is called the Periodic Labor Force Survey of 2017-18 onwards, which is also carried out by the NSSO. And we also have a unique data source uh, which is brought out by the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy also called the CMIE CPHS which is the Consumer Pyramid Household Survey which publishes results from 2016 onwards on employment unemployment scenario, consumer expenditure scenario and so on. So, this is a brief about some of the important data sources that have been under the scanner for some time now with regard to the employment unemployment statistics. Now, let me also uh, while uh, looking at the labor force uh, outcomes in terms of women's participation, ultimately we are trying to connect it to the education market and how they have transitioned to the labor market, whether or not they have transitioned to the labor market. Before we get into the complexity of this discussion, it is important I think to have um, some understanding about uh, the difference between labor force and workforce. In the last class, if you remember, I spoke about the health workforce and we also spoke about the health labor market. Uh, but for a student of uh, economics uh, who is getting introduced to the in nitty gritties of education and health investments uh, connecting it to labor market, it is important that we understand there is a difference or distinction in terms of definition with regard to labor force and workforce. So, what is it? Labor force is basically defined as people of the working age population and in India the age group that is considered as working age population is 15 to 59 years. And these are people who are either in paid employment or are actively seeking some form of employment. And this usually the labor force, the definition of labor force excludes people who are in educational institutions because they are actively pursuing education and therefore are not available for the labor market or they are doing unpaid domestic work and do not wish to undertake paid work for some reason or the other. So, this is the broad definition of labor force. The workforce on the contrary consists of people who are in paid employment of any kind and this may be self-employment, casual labor, salaried work or it may include unpaid work performed in the production of goods and services which is sold in the market. So, there is a clear distinction between what constitutes the labor force and the workforce and it is but obvious that the labor force is a larger subset of uh, containing the workforce. Uh, workforce is a subset of what is called the labor force. Now, in Indian economy, most of the workforce do not have work all year round and hence the NSSO has conventionally used two measures uh, to understand uh, workforce participation. So, we have two important concepts called the principal status that is those who have work for at least six months and subsidiary status that is those who have work between one and six months. So, the NSSO gives out uh, definitions or estimates based upon principal uh, status and subsidiary status. Now, we have two uh, key parameters of interest uh, given this definition of labor force and workforce. Uh, that is uh, based upon the labor force, we calculate what is called the labor force participation rate and uh, given the workforce, we calculate what is called the unemployment rate. 
So, the labor force participation rate is basically the percentage of working age people who work or want work. They may not be working, but they may be actively or uh, intermittently seeking work. The unemployment rate is on the contrary, the percentage of those in the labor force who want work, but do not have work for some reason. So, they are unemployed. And the worker population ratio is the proportion of working age people who have work. So, to be able to come up with estimates or to be able to make sense of the estimates with respect to labor force and unemployment, we need to have some clarity about these two uh, terminologies. Although people uh, generally people tend to use these terms synonymously, they are not the same. We are talking about two different pools or we are talking about a, two, a bigger and a smaller pool of population which gives us estimates about uh, the labor force participation rate and the unemployment rate. And the estimation of these rates becomes important for us to have an assessment of the labor market situation in a country. Now, I uh, want to talk about uh, uh, two uh, reports that have been uh, released in India in the last few years. One is the India Employment Report of 2016, uh, which gives us some view about how India's labor market has changed in the last few years. And then I also want to uh, introduce to the learners a report called the State of Working India Report, which is brought out by the Center for Sustainable Employment uh, in, uh, in Azim Premji University. And these are two uh, series of, these are two important reports. Uh, the India Employment Report is a one-time report, but the State of Working India is a series which works around the issues of how India's labor market and how India's employment structure has been changing over a period of time. So, I think for learners of this course, it is important to draw some, to, to discuss some of the conclusions and interpretations that are arising from these reports because it has some takeaways for us when we are trying to understand whether or not uh, the uh, population who is engaged in education is transitioning to the labor market or not. But of course, in today's lesson, our focus is mostly on the women labor force. So, what does the India Employment Report of 2016 tell us? It first tells us about the size of our labor force and it tells us that by uh, the 2011-12 NSS EUS report and this uh, the India Employment Report 2016 is based upon the results of the NSS EUS uh, estimates. So, this one tells us that there are about 473 million labor force by the year 2016. We had so many labor force uh, in this country who are identifying themselves as the labor force, meaning that they are available for work, they are in work or they may be seeking work. And of this 473 million labor force, we had about 91 percent in the working age population, meaning they are in the 15 to 59 years uh, of uh, age bracket. And among them, 78 percent were uh, male uh, labor force uh, and uh, 68 percent were rural. So, which means that we still have a labor market which is largely dominant of men in the labor force and also we are slightly uh, more rural than uh, urban in terms of our labor market uh, structure. Now, among the 473 million labor force, we had about 2 million children who were less than uh, 15 years of age and they are in the labor force that can be identified as the child labor force. Uh, 39 million were older workers, that is they were uh, more or equal to 60 years and they were in the labor force. So, that is in terms of the size of the labor force. And later we will see that over a period of time, the size of labor force has also increased in India. Uh, but uh, if you, uh, in terms of the relative size of the labor force, we may not be doing very well. Now, what has happened to the labor force growth rate? The India Employment Report of 2016 tells us that there is a declining labor force growth and the growth of labor force fell from 1.8 percent between the period 1983 to 99-2000 to 1.4 percent between the period 99-2000 to 2011-12. Now, I would like to uh, impress upon the learners here that when we are taking these years here, 1983-99-2000-2011-12, you can recall that in the beginning of this class, I mentioned about some of the NSS EUS survey reports and the quinquennial rounds. So, these estimates uh, that are calculated are based upon the 
estimates given out by these survey reports. So, these are based upon household surveys, large sample household surveys and uh, therefore, these are reliable estimates, official uh, estimates coming from the official statistics of the country. Now, with regard to the growth of labor force falling from 1.8 percent between the decade 80s to 90s to 1.4 percent in the decade 90s to 2000s, the reason provided was that there has been a decline in child labor due to decline in poverty. So, this is one of the favorable uh, reasons as far as the labor market structure is concerned that because growth rates have risen, poverty rates have fallen and therefore, uh, in terms of labor supply to the labor market, households have withdrawn children from the labor force and therefore, there has been a decline in child labor which is, which is reflecting in terms of the uh, fall in the labor force growth. So, although there is, a, uh, there is a fall in the labor force growth, it may not necessarily be a uh, negative aspect because the decline is largely attributed to the fall in the child labor force. But there is another important uh, development that took place between this period of 80s, 90s and 90s, 2000s that is the growth of working age labor force also declined from 1.9 percent to 1.5 percent. Now, remember here that when we are talking about child labor, they are officially not in the working age population because the working age population is 15 to 59 years and child labor are estimated for all those children who are less than 15 years old. So, in terms of the overall labor force, if we are accounting for uh, children in the labor force without considering the 15 to 59 age bracket, then we saw a decline in uh, labor force and that was attributed to the decline in uh, child labor in the labor force. But what we also see is a decline in the labor force as far as the working age population is concerned and that is from 1.9 percent to 1.5 percent and the India Employment Report of 2016 uh, reasons that this is mostly this decline is mostly because of decline in the labor force participation of working age women. So, then that warrants a question as to if education achievements have increased over a period of time, if uh, women's enrollment in higher education institutions have increased, women's enrollment in secondary education, higher secondary education have increased, then why does it show up in the form of declining labor force participation of working age women? What is the economic interpretation of this decline in the LFP or the labor force participation of working age women? So, moving on the India Employment Report 2016 also tells us that um, we did not seem to have a demographic dividend. Now, there has been a lot of discussion surrounding the fact that India's is a youth population and there is a very large proportion of young population in the country and therefore, there is a possibility of having a huge demographic dividend or uh, in other words, the returns to young population will be very high because then we have a very productive population. So, uh, but the India Employment Report 2016 pointed out that um, there seems to be a youth bulge, but this bulge does not seem to be uh, uh, reflecting or there is no translation in terms of demographic dividend. It says that the demographic transition did not seem to have an effect on our labor force. Uh, the share of youth population which is 15 to 24 years in the working age population, this was rising between 1983 and 99, 2000, but their share in working age labor force had been falling. So, this youth bulge in population did not translate into a youth bulge in labor force. So, while the youth population increased, they were in education, but this youth population did not transform into the labor force of the country. Uh, so, therefore, the uh, report argued that we did not even have a theoretical possibility of a demographic dividend. Our dependency ratio increased from 2.6 percent to 2.8 percent and this, these developments obviously were not very uh, favorable for the progress of a country. Uh, some of the other findings was that between 99, 2000 and 2011, 12 both labor force and employment grew at 1.5 percent per annum and the unemployment rate was stable at around uh, 3 percent. Now, how can we assess uh, overall improvement in employment conditions? Uh, the report cited two important uh, uh, parameters there. One is that there should be favorable changes in the employment structure of the country and the second is that there should be quality improvement meaning that the increase in earnings per worker in different types of employment. So, then were there improvement in employment conditions during 2000-2012? Uh, 
The India Employment Report of 2016 constructed an employment structure index which showed a significant rise, meaning that employment structure indeed changed favorably. And how did it change? Workers moved from informal to formal jobs. They also moved from casual employment to regular employment. They moved from wage employment in the unorganized sector to wage employment in the organized sector. So, in terms of the employment structure, there seemed to be some kind of a favorable improvement. The report also highlighted that underemployment of the employed declined in all types of employment. Underemployment meaning uh, that uh, the numbers who are employed are more than desired. If more than desired levels of uh, population are employed in a certain sector, then we would refer it to as some form of underemployment, which means that if we can remove some workers from a certain sector, they can be more efficiently employed in another sector. Uh, so, underemployment of the employer declined in all types of employment. It also highlighted the growing importance of informal employment in the organized sector. Now, while there was a lot of movement from the unorganized to the organized sector, a new development that happened in the 2000s was with respect to the, the growth of the uh, growth of informal employment in the organized sector. There was acceleration of employment growth in the organized sector, but movement of workers from informal employment in unorganized to informal employment in organized and that was mostly because of access of low skilled workers to join in the organized sector. But despite some of these positive improvements or developments, conditions of employment remained poor uh, based upon the 11-12 NSS EUS uh, estimates. Self-employment and casual wage employment accounted for 78 percent of total employment in the economy. Now, the uh, India Employment Report 2016 brought out a certain picture of the Indian economy with respect to employment, unemployment and labor force participation. From 2018 onwards, uh, the Center for Sustainable Employment's report on state of working India also gave out few key labor market indicators uh, for the period 2011 to 15. In the absence of uh, a new NSS EUS survey, uh, there is uh, an important source on labor market estimates provided by the Labor Bureau under the Ministry of Labor and uh, putting both of these estimates together the state of working India came up with a few estimates which I think is important to be discussed. So, on this table here you see uh, some of these years for which the estimates are available 2011 estimates from the NSS and then 2011 from the Labor Bureau and then we have all Labor Bureau estimates. The second column shows us the uh, population uh, in the working age group uh, more than 15 years in millions. Uh, so, we see that from 11 to 2015, the uh, overall population increased from 850 million to 926 million. Of that, labor force uh, participation rate remained more or less uh, stable. In fact, there was a slight decline from 51.6 percent, there seems to be a slight decline to 50.3 percent. But if we look at uh, the, if we try to understand the average for these years, it was more or less around 50 percent, 50 to 51 percent. In terms of labor force in millions, also there was not too much of a drastic change, but we moved from 438 millions to about 465 millions. In terms of the unemployment rate, the India Employment Report of 2016. Uh, talked about a stable unemployment rate of about 3 percent in 2011-12 uh, and this uh, report, the State of Working India report came up with the estimate of about 2.7 percent, but by 2015 the unemployment rate had risen to about 5 percent. And similarly, the unemployed millions in terms of the absolute numbers had risen from 11 percent to about 23 percent and uh, if you look at the workforce, the workforce also rose. Uh, concomitantly with that of the labor force, we had 426.9 million workers in 2011 and in 2015 we had about 442 million workers in the population. Now, one of the important points based upon this table here is that the quantity of employment or the workforce did not really keep pace with the labor force growth and there was a widening gap giving rise to unprecedented levels of unemployment as we moved from a 3 percent rate of unemployment to 5 percent rate of unemployment. 
Now, uh, the State of Working India 2018 also gave out a few more uh, findings with respect to uh, GDP growth and labor market performance. Uh, with respect to GDP growth, we know that India's GDP had been rising, but then it did not create as many jobs that it should have. Between 2013 and 2015, total employment shrank by 7 million. The rate of unemployment among youth and the higher educated rose to about 16 percent. So, we had an overall unemployment rate of about 5 percent, but the rate of unemployment among youth and higher educated, those who are supposed to have transitioned from the education market to the labor market, seem to have risen to about 16 percent. And since 2011, India's unemployment scenario, the state of working India 2018 argued, was no longer that of underemployment, but high open unemployment, because we had an overall uh, unemployment rate of 5 percent and a youth unemployment rate of about 16 percent. And this increase in unemployment could be seen across all Indian states, but these were most severe in the northern states. The other important finding of the state of working India 2018 was that wages were rising, but they were still below the 7th central pay commission minimum. Between 2010 and 2015, real wages had grown at 2 percent for organized manufacturing, 4 percent for unorganized manufacturing, 5 percent for unorganized services and 7 percent for agriculture. But we continue to face low earnings despite wage growth. About 82 percent of male and 92 percent of female workers earn less than rupees 10,000 per month, but the minimum salary recommended by the 7th uh, Central Pay Commission was rupees 18,000 per month. So, wages are rising, real wages were rising, but there were uh, gender disparities as well as there were the minimum wages, uh, the, wa the actual wages that being received was much below the minimum wages specified. Wage productivity divergence was another important finding of the uh, State of Working India 2018. They showed that labor productivity and wages were not growing concomitantly, they were not growing in balance. In organized manufacturing, productivity increased by 6 times since 1990s, but wages increased by only 1 and a half times. Similarly, growth of managerial and supervisory salaries was also much lower than productivity growth and labor share of income was very low. So, when we talk about uh, GDP growth, what was the share of uh, wages or the wage share of growth was uh, turned out to be very low. So, while growth, uh, economic growth was uh, being sustained somehow, labor share of income was very low in the country. In terms of gender and caste disparities, the finding was that the disparities are reducing, but they continue to be high. Women were 16 percent of all service workers, uh, service sector workers, but 60 percent of domestic workers were women. Overall, women earn 65 percent of men's earnings and women's participation in paid workforce is low, but there are interstate disparities. Scheduled castes were 18.5 percent of all workers, but 46 percent of leather workers. Caste based segregation persisted, but reduced in many areas due to government programs. Both SC and ST groups are better represented in public administration now, and the caste earnings gap is large than the gender earnings gap. There was also a redefinition of the formal sector in India. A task force of Niti Aayog recommended redefinition of formal employment to include workers covered under various provident funds, insurance or pension schemes as well as workers subject to tax deduction at source. So, this definition basically increases the size of formal workforce to 15 to 25 percent instead of the earlier quoted 7 to 10 percent. So, there was a redefinition of what constitutes the formal sector by including some of the important factors such as those who are uh, beneficiaries of pension schemes or uh, those who are uh, beneficiaries of insurance or various provident funds and so on. And therefore, the size of the formal sector increased because of redefinition. There was another report of the State of Working India in 2019, which provided primacy to the issue of unemployment rates among the educated youth. And uh, for this, this table here shows uh, estimates from various rounds of NSSO 99-2000, 2004-5 and 11-12. So, this is the period of the 2000s for which we have official statistics from the NSS US. And then we have information from the Labor Bureau, which provides us some scenario of what happened in the 
uh, early part of the decade of 2011 uh, onwards, so 11, 12 to 15, 16. And then we had some information from the Center for Monitoring Economy, Indian Economy, which gives us information for the period 2016 and 18. Now, all of these information I am discussing for the pre-COVID period because after uh, COVID-19 lockdowns uh, were lifted and then uh, the periodic labor force surveys, we have seen some improvement of employment rates in India. So, therefore, those estimates have not been accounted for in this discussion here. We are looking at the pre-COVID period. What happened to the overall unemployment rate if we have to look at the period between 99, 2000 and 2018? you would see that overall unemployment had increased from about 2.7 percent, 3 percent in the early uh, 2000s to about uh, 5 percent in 2015-16 and to about 6 percent in 2018. So, pre-COVID we already had very high rates of unemployment. Uh, in fact, in the period 2016, the CMI had uh, calculated that the overall unemployment rate in the country was about 8 percent. If we look at male unemployment, male unemployment also sort of uh, was uh, more or less um, followed the overall unemployment rate from 2.9 percent in 99-2000, uh, 2.7, 2.4 in the 2000s, it rose to about 5 percent in uh, 2016 and uh, in 2018. But the major changes were happening with respect to female unemployment rate. We would see that in 1999-2000, female unemployment was around 2 percent, but in 2016, the CMI calculated that the female unemployment was as high as 22 percent. And uh, by 2018, there seemed to have been a decline, but it was still very high at about 14 percent. So, the massive unemployment scenario that we saw in the context of India was largely because of female unemployment. And that takes us back to the question of uh, when we saw that um, while overall uh, labor force uh, participation declined, the labor force participation decline is also mostly because of the decline in female labor force employment. Now, let us also look at the unemployment rate among the educated, which is those who have a degree or diploma beyond higher secondary education class 12. The overall unemployment rates among this section of the population was unprecedentedly high. It was already high at 10 percent in 99-2000 and it became 15 percent in 2015-16 and 2016 and 18 it was also as high as 16 percent and 12 percent. The overall male educated youth unemployment rate was also very high, 8.4 percent in 99-2000 to 9.7 percent in 2018. But if you look at the female row, the female uh, youth unemployment rate, we began with 21 percent and it had gone up to about 30 percent, 40 percent and 34 percent in the years 2015-16 based upon the Labor Bureau estimate, 2016 based upon the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy estimate and again CMIE estimate of 34 percent. So, overall what we see is that there is a secular rise in unemployment, secular meaning there is a long term rise in unemployment rate as well as unemployed among the educated youth. Now, one of the reasons why we are looking at many of these sources uh, is to uh, understand that there may be comparability issues between these data sources, but uh, the writing is very clear that whichever source we take, the unemployment rate seems to have risen both overall among the male, but it seems to be unprecedentedly high among the female population. So, obviously, there are some structural transformation that is happening within the economy, which is certainly impacting female labor market participation more than those of the others. This is a figure based upon the State of Working India 2019, which gives us the trends of workforce participation in rural and urban areas since 2016. So, if you look at these graphs here, the workforce participation among men and women also, uh, this is among men. So, this is among uh, rural and urban uh, men. So, what we see is workforce participation among men in both rural and urban areas also seems to have declined, which is reflective of the larger levels of unemployment in the country. 
If you look at uh, the trends in labor force participation in rural and urban areas, so it is not just that work is not available, but people who are seeking work has also uh, come down uh, in the uh, rural and urban areas as far as men are concerned. So, some of the important uh, uh, points uh, with respect to state of working India 2019 were that unemployment has risen steadily since 2011 based upon whichever household survey we examine whether it is the labor bureau EUS or the PLFS the periodic labor force survey or the CMI CPHS data source. The second point was that the higher educated and the young are vastly over represented among the unemployed population and the less educated have seen job losses and reduced opportunities of work. So, education certainly is a pathway to better employment opportunities. So, those who are less educated seem to be having very less opportunities, but those who are higher educated also seem to be facing a problem with being able to transition into the labor market. Women are worse off than men with respect to levels of unemployment as well as reduced labor force participation rate. So, in India currently unemployment and not underemployment is a primary economic issue. Now, let me come to the second part of this lesson where I want to discuss about access to education or what does education access look like and uh, what does uh, the uh, tr their transition to the labor market look like in terms of the periodic labor force survey data, the recent data sources that we have. So, let us begin with uh, access to education in India. So, this one here gives you the data from 2016-17 and 2021-22. These are based upon the periodic labor force uh, survey, the new surveys that has replaced the EUS or the NSS EUS, the employment and unemployment survey rounds. We have net enrollment rate for school education, this is elementary education, secondary education and higher secondary education. So, we see that in elementary education which is from class 1 to 8, the overall enrollment rates are very high, but in terms of uh, secondary education, there is a lot of dropout from elementary education to secondary education. So, secondary education is where uh, the problem area lies in India. The net enrollments in secondary education are far less than uh, that in elementary education. So, we may have possibly uh, addressed some of the bottlenecks or challenges with respect to elementary education, but we still have a very long way to go as far as secondary education is concerned because secondary education sort of becomes the foundation for uh, students transformation to higher secondary education and then to higher education. So, we have uh, net enrollments in secondary education are far less than that of net enrollments in elementary education and as we move further we see that there is a lot of dropout from secondary to higher secondary as well. The uh, higher secondary enrollment rates are also much lower than uh, what we see in the case of elementary and secondary education. Between 2016-17 and 2021-22, there seems to be a slight reversal of higher secondary enrollment rates, but even then we see that they are much um, less than what should be expected. Now, let us also look at the higher education uh, gross enrollment here. These are gross enrollment rates, which means that the net enrollment rates will be much below than what we are seeing here on the graph. So, uh, overall the uh, higher education uh, enrollment rates are also much lower if we compare with the higher secondary education rates. Remember this one shows gross enrollment rate, but this one shows net enrollment rate. So, uh, it can be expected that the net enrollment rates are much below 24 percent and 27 percent or at least below 24 and 27 percent. So, what we see here is that as we move to higher and higher levels of education, enrollment uh, rates seem to be declining. In many of the previous classes, we have discussed about the public report on basic education, quality primary education, millions of children enrolling in schools but not staying in schools or not being able to transition from primary schools to secondary schools and so on. So, the overall scenario with respect to India also shows that we have addressed some of the bottlenecks of primary education or elementary education, but with respect to access to education there are huge problems of access, availability, spending. Uh, out of pocket expenditures and so on when it comes to secondary, higher secondary and um, higher education scenario. 
So these are some of the challenges in accessing uh, secondary education. There are high dropout rates, there is a, a rise in household out of pocket expenditure, there is also inadequate provisioning of government schools and there is lower allocation of public uh, finances. But of course, you know, all of these things need to be discussed within the larger ambit of Right to Education Act of 2019 and the National Education Policy of 2020. Since the focus of today's lecture is to uh, go back to the discussion on labor market, so I will now move on to the labor market scenario by connecting the education scenario with the labor market. Now, in terms of uh, school enrollment, uh, between 2015-16 and 2021-22, um, these figures uh, show what are the in the absolute numbers of school enrollments in India. So the blue line on the top shows enrollments in government schools, followed by enrollments in private unaided schools and enrollments in government aided schools. So if we look at the enrollments in uh, government schools, they seem to have more or less uh, remained um, stagnated at 145 million to 143 million between 15, 16 and 2021, 22. Now, what is the scenario with respect to higher education? Uh, we have about uh, by 2021 based upon the All India uh, Higher Education Survey uh, database which we have discussed earlier, we had about 1113 universities of which 657 are government managed. 10 are private deemed uh, universities and 446 are private unaided universities. Colleges are about 43,796, 21% colleges are government colleges, 13.6% uh, are private aided and 65% are private unaided uh, colleges. So these uh, slides and the previous slides that I discussed with respect to enrollments in different levels of education sort of gives us a sense of how many are in education. Now let us see what is whether the transition from education to employment is happening or not. So this uh, figure here shows uh, the labor force participation rate with respect to rural male, urban male, rural female and urban uh, female. And uh, we see that of course the percentage labor force participation of men is much higher than that of uh, uh, women and but between women rural female labor force participation is higher than that of the urban female uh, labor force participation. Now it will not be wrong to assume that of the number of women who have been uh, uh, educated or higher educated moved from higher secondary uh, to higher education is relatively higher in the among the urban females. But if you see in terms of labor force participation rate, we see that you know the rural female labor force participation is higher than that of the urban female labor force participation. And between 2011 to 2021-22, there has been a marginal rise from 15 percent to 18 percent. Now let us also for a comparative view look at the women's labor force participation uh, in the age bracket 25 years and above in South Asia and the countries we have considered here are Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan and uh, the whole of Southern Asia. So if you look at all of these together, we are in third place only after Afghanistan and Pakistan. So India's uh, overall women's labor force participation is very low if we compare the South Asian countries as well. We are at only 26 percent and this is based upon the year 2020 data. So what is this Indian youth in the age group of 15 to 35 years doing? So generally the Indian youth population is considered in terms of official statistics or estimates we consider the age 15 to 25 but for the purpose of our uh, lecture here I have considered the period 15 to 35 years uh, because generally in the Indian condition we have seen that uh, those who are in higher education tend to be entering the labor market up till the age of 35 years. So let us see what is the distribution of youth across status and this is based upon the 2019-20 PLFS data. So these are the activity statuses, the uh, principal and subsidiary status and uh, employment. So these are employed, these are unemployed and these are the youth that are studying and these are the youth that are missing from the labor market. So if we look at those who are employed, 63% are employed as far as male are concerned, 23% female are employed. 
7 percent male are unemployed, 2 percent female are unemployed. Now, if you look at those who are studying, 27 percent are studying, 22 percent are studying among female. But if you look at the number that is missing from the labor market, meaning that those who are no longer identifying themselves as a laborer in the labor force, it is only 1 percent among males, but 52 percent among females, which means that although the enrollments in higher education, enrollments in higher secondary education seems to have increased as far as females are concerned, but those females are not in the labor market. They are not being available as labor force in the labor market and which is a matter of serious concern as far as the Indian labor market is concerned. So, what are these people who are missing from the labor market in engaged in? So, there are two categories that we can look at based upon the household survey results that we have. So, there is uh, domestic duties only and domestic duties and other work of household use. So, we see that as far as these categories are concerned, 37 percent female are involved in domestic duties only and 15 percent are involved in domestic duties and other work of households and 36 percent of uh, working women are basically unpaid family workers. So, in terms of this question of what is Indian youth doing, we find that around half of young Indian women is not even entering the labor market leading to considerably low labor force participation. Perhaps there is some kind of a discouragement uh, of the educated uh, youth as far as female educated youth is concerned that is not allowing them to even enter the labor market and identifying themselves as laborers in the labor market. There seems to be a gender gap in employment uh, which impacts both economic growth as well as women's overall employment. So, why are females not joining the labor force? If we have to look at some of the reasons as to why uh, what is impacting female uh, labor force participation which is leading to low labor market participation. There can be many issues that have been identified based upon empirical studies. One is of course, the care, work and social reproduction responsibilities at the household level. There are employability issues in terms of workplace safety and so on and so forth. Lack of creation of adequate jobs because jobs are not available closer to homes. Uh, there are of course, measurement issues in labor surveys also which we can ignore for the time being. There are recruiters bias against women, women employees are not recruited in the labor force because of uh, various concerns. There is inadequate public infrastructure, public safety issues. There are also patriarchal norms of marriage, mobility and social status that impacts labor force participation of women in the Indian labor market. Now, with regard to the distribution of students in the 18 to 29 years across type of course attended. Uh, so, this is based upon the All India Survey of Higher Education. We see that this is with this we see between the period 2007-8 to 2017-18 and uh, we see that those who are enrolled in arts and humanities is uh, very high as far as the male and female are concerned. It is much higher for the females, but if you look at those who are enrolled in engineering subjects, the number of female enrollments are much below than the male enrollment. So, this also shows that there continues to be some kind of a systemic bias against uh, women preferring uh, the certain streams of education which probably are also not attracting employment in the uh, labor market. Now, with regard to youth unemployment rate being high, it is also important to note that while overall youth unemployment rates are very high, it is even higher for female youth. So, there is a greater job crisis for the educated youth, but more so for the female youth and this greater challenge to create jobs for highly educated females, more so in urban areas. So, this indicates a demand side crisis, meaning that while uh, so as far as the labor market is concerned, I have earlier discussed in the earlier classes that the households are the suppliers of labor and the firms are the demand side of the uh, labor market. So, the demand for households labor supply. So, in the context of the educated urban female youth, when we see that there is a very high uh, rate of unemployment that also perhaps indicates some kind of a demand side crunch or that women's labor force is not being adequately demanded whether due to lack of opportunities or whether because of a systemic bias there is a demand side crisis as far as women's labor is concerned. 
There is also a lack of creation of jobs in relation to educational attainment due to inadequate formal sector jobs with decent work conditions. The labor market is unable to meet the aspirations of the youth leading towards a discouraged uh, worker effect. So, this uh, table here shows the unemployment rate based upon 2019-20. I did mention that when we were discussing the India Employment Report of 2016 and the State of Working India Report of 2018-19, that based upon the estimates of the periodic labor force survey from 17-18 onwards, we do see some uh, improvements in unemployment rates. So, for the age group 15 to 59 years, which is the working age population, the uh, in rural India, male unemployment was 5 percent, female was 2.8 percent. In urban India, male unemployment was 6.8 percent and female unemployment was 9.4 percent and overall uh, at the all India level, male and female unemployments was 5.5 and 4.5 percent. So, there seems to be an employment crisis as far as urban females are concerned. For uh, 15 to 35 uh, years, if we look at the youth population. I am of course looking at an expanded youth population here because the international definition of the age bracket for youth population is 15 to 24 years or 25 years. But for the Indian labor market because higher education uh, transition to labor market continues beyond the age of 25, I have looked up the period for the age bracket 15 to 35 years. And then we see that the unemployment situation becomes all the more dire for the uh, youth population and for the female youth particularly. In urban India now we see that the unemployment rate for uh, youth uh, female is 17 percent which is massively high as far as unemployment rate is concerned. And if we categorize it for uh, people who are uh, below primary and are illiterates, elementary, secondary, graduates, postgraduates and above we see that the numbers are very concerning for those who are uh, have received higher education. So, while higher education is considered as a pathway to better forms of employment or uh, participating in better employment structures and so on and so forth, as far as the Indian labor market is concerned, we see that there is some sort of a break as far as this bridge uh, used for transitioning from higher education to labor market is concerned. Now, uh, in the last part of this lesson, let me uh, sort of give out some of the figures with respect to public financing of education because we know that a lot of uh, financing for education comes from the public sector and so it is important to look at public expenditure and education as a share of GDP. So, between 2008-9 and 2019-20 as a share of GDP expenditure in education ranged between 3.6 to 4.3 percent and uh, there was a, uh, a target of SDG target of reaching 6 percent of GDP. Uh, India has not reached the target of 6 percent GDP to be invested in public education after more than three decades of the target year. In fact, the education policy uh, had uh, put a target of spending 6 percent of uh, GDP on uh, education, but that has not been met. As far as uh, expenditure is concerned on education, the state governments are the primary spenders and the central share includes schemes that are fully funded by center or the central share of centrally sponsored schemes and other uh, central grants. This figure here shows the uh, state share and the central share and between 14, 15 and 2021 you can see that the state share of expenditure on education uh, ranges between 74 to 76 percent and the center share is the uh, rest. In terms of public financing of uh, school education, so the largest amount of expenditure is on adult education, uh, is on elementary education and uh, then uh, the higher education university and higher education receives about uh, 13 percent. Uh, two third of overall education expenditure is spent on schools, states are the primary senders of school education and the state share of course varies across states. Uh, but this is the overall scenario with respect to public financing of school education. So, now let us uh, based upon this uh, uh, discussion so far what we have discussed is we uh, wanted to understand some of the contemporary uh, scenarios with respect to India's labor market. What are we discussing with respect to unemployment? We have seen that education and health investments has uh, is deeply interconnected with the labor market. 
uh, human capital investments uh, are called investments because uh, then human capital figures up in uh, the labor market of the country and the labor market uh, is one of the important source of uh, labor productivity as well as overall economic productivity in a country. So, in this lesson we wanted to understand what are the contemporary scenarios with respect to India's labor market uh, starting with the unemployment scene. And then we saw whether or not uh, transitions from education to labor market is happening or not. And we saw that higher education, unemployed people who are higher educated or the youth who are higher educated seem to be facing very high levels of unemployment in India today. But the primary stakeholders who are facing a lot of crisis are the female youth as far as unemployment is concerned and the uh, crisis of unemployment seems to be acute in the context of female youth in the urban areas and those who are very highly educated. So, let us now move towards summarizing some of these uh, key features of women's labor market complexities in the Indian context. We do understand that women's labor market participation in India is complex and it is shaped by a mix of economic, social and cultural factors. So, first point is that there is very low female labor force participation rate. There is some kind of discouragement as far as uh, women's labor force participation is concerned. It has been persistently low and even declining in the recent years. Uh, for some states, it is as high as 20 percent, uh, but it is hovering about uh, 20 to 25 percent. And this decline is partly attributed to rising educational attainment without sufficient matching job opportunities, social norms and lack of safe working environments. Occupational segregation seems to be very high for women. There is horizontal segregation as well as vertical segregation. What is horizontal segregation? We see that women are concentrated in certain sections like agriculture, education, healthcare and informal sectors and there is a significant under representation of women in high paying industries such as manufacturing, engineering and technology. And if we have to look back and look at women's presence in certain streams of education, we also saw that women's uh, enrollments in um, general level of education including arts and humanities is very high, but their enrollments in STEM or engineering is very uh, low, perhaps also shows up in their significant under representation in the high paying industries such as manufacturing, engineering and technology. There is also vertical segregation within industries women are more often found in low paying or less prestigious positions compared to their male counterparts and fewer women occupy managerial or leadership roles reflecting a glass ceiling in career progression. There is also a lot of informal sector dominance, a large proportion of employed women work in the in informal sector characterized by low wages, lack of job security and very poor working conditions and jobs here are often vulnerable lacking social security benefits or formal contracts which makes these women susceptible to exploitation. There is a lot of uh, burden of unpaid and care work. Indian women seem to be bearing a disproportionate burden of unpaid household and care work which limits their ability to participate in the formal labor market and cultural norms often expect women to prioritize family responsibilities over paid employment and which reinforcing their economic dependence. There are also a lot of uh, mismatch as far as education and skills are concerned. There is of course improvement in women's education levels, but there seems to be a mismatch between women's qualifications and the skills needed for available jobs. There are gender biases in training programs and skill development initiatives which further restrict women's access to emerging opportunities especially in uh, STEM fields. There are safety and mobility concerns, there is limited access to safe and reliable transportation combined with concerns over safety and harassment restricting women's ability to seek employment far from home and this especially impacts their participation in urban labor markets that discourages work during non-standard hours. There are of course cultural norms and discrimination. Uh, because societal attitudes often limit women's economic participation, particularly in regions where patriarchal values are more pronounced. There is also a lack of supportive workplace policies, availability of policies like paid maternity leave, childcare support, flexible work arrangements in many sectors and even where such policies exist, they are often not effectively implemented which discourages women from continuing in their careers post childbirth. So, for this uh, lecture, I have taken uh, references from some of the published works uh, by me and my uh, research scholars 
which have been published in the Indian Journal of Agricultural Economics and the Indian Journal of Labor Economics. So, we have uh, published in the last few years on some of these issues surrounding women's labor market uh, conditions and participation issues. Uh, there are a few papers that also focuses uh, specifically on India's Northeast and the gender gap in the labor market of India's Northeast. I would encourage uh, students uh, to also look up these papers to have a more holistic understanding about some of these issues. Uh, but as far as this lesson is concerned, the primary uh, objective of this lesson was to connect these issues because we have been discussing about education and health investments, but ultimately when we put the stories together, the story of education market, the health market and then we combine it with the labor market, we see that there are deep interconnections as to why a student of economics or a student of social sciences should be able to connect these issues and look at uh, uh, and uh, sort of imagine these uh, problems in a different light. So, uh, with this I end today's lesson and in the final lesson of this course which will be the uh, third lesson of this week, we will summarize and conclude the discussion based upon all the uh, classes that we have taken so far. So, till then thank you very much. Mm -hmm.